Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our next session here. Thank you for being at the NMQF uh, conference. Uh, we are talking about a very important issue this morning, and I am elated to be on the stage with some wonderful doctors who will help us think through and talk through one of the most important issues facing our country at this time. You know, out of all of the maternal issues that have been seen in the United States of America, over 700 women died from, during childbirth last year. Uh, what we know from looking at the statistics, or going deeper into those statistics, is that black women were three times more likely uh, to die during childbirth than other women, even when um, you compared socioeconomic status and normalized those statistics out. Uh, it's a concern not only for the people uh, that look like me, that sound like me, and that live in the places that I live, but it should also be a greater concern for us all. Uh, there should not be a statistic that says like that we need to have this conversation about this topic. Uh, but today we're going to have uh, hopefully some experts talk to us about ways we can improve not only black maternal health, but by improving black maternal health, we will be able to improve maternal health as a whole. So today I'll be joined by some experts on this topic, and I'd love to engage you as an audience uh, to ask us questions so that we can develop a full conversation and leave here with some actionable items that will help us all be better in this space. Uh, first, I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Nueva, Villanueva, no. Villanueva, uh, who will start us off with a conversation this morning about what black maternal health could be and should be. So I'll start by asking you, how did you get here today and what should we talk about? Well, I took Amtrak down from New York. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, my name is Rachel Villanueva, as he said. I am an OBGYN in New York City. So I'm still practicing, and I serve as the president of the National Medical Association right now. Um, whoop, whoop. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I think for me, the topic of maternal mortality is really um, a very important and uh, has become my passion. Um, the statistics, I think, we've become almost numb to these statistics because we rattle them off quite easily. 700, 800 women are dying in birth in a year. Um, black women are dying three times the rate of white women in the United States. The United States has the worst numbers of industrialized nations. And we just kind of say them as though it's really a matter of course. And I think we really need to stop and really think about what and who we're talking about. We're talking about our sisters, we're talking about the women in our, or birthing people in our communities that, who are important to us. So one life is one life too much to be dying in what should be the most joyful time in, in a person's life and in a family's life. I think when people come into my office and they are so excited to have that positive pregnancy test, they come with a lot of hopes and expectations and dreams around this new life that's being created and that they are taking care of. And I think the last thing that a family thinks about is this person who is nurturing this new life dying as a result of this, this uh, new life. And so I think we have so much work to do in this space. I am really encouraged, as I said this morning, with all of the thoughtful conversation that happens, it has been happening in this room, because I know that this is the space where we're gonna make that change that we need to make for the people in our community. Um, I think we're not surprised by the numbers, three times the rate, three times the rate of dying and hospitalizations because of COVID. I think when we talked about obesity yesterday, we could have put the those same numbers in, these are, these, are not, uh, these are not numbers by chance that happen in our community. These are systemic and structural, there are systemic and structural reasons why these things are occurring in our community. And I think we have to come together. We really, I think this panel is such a powerful panel because it really looks at all of those, um, all of those factors that, um, that are implicated in, in the rates that we're seeing. It's not just what happens in the hospital, although that's a very important part of it. 
It's what's happening on the outside. How are patients coming to us? How healthy or how unhealthy they are? Where they're living? Do they have access to nutritious foods, as Dr. F um, I was to say, <laughs> Dr. Fatima will talk about? Um, uh, do they have access to green spaces? Do they live in a safe environment? We really have to consider all of, all of these things, and I think that's what the panel is really going to discuss today. Absolutely. I don't want to undersell Dr. Villanueva. She was the first student National Medical Association president to also become the National Medical Association president. Yeah. So I think that that deserves a round of applause as well. So, so next up, we had Dr. Rupa Basu, but I don't know if she is available to us yet. She was having some technical issues connecting. Um, so until we're able to get her, uh, she's appearing virtually today, connected to us. Why don't we go with here. Dr. Amber Hewitt. Dr. Hewitt is the Chief Equity Officer for the Government of the District of Columbia, and in this role, she serves and works in collaboration with district leadership on racial equity uh, and the racial equity lens across government relations uh, and operations in the District of Columbia. So Dr. Hewitt, can you talk to us about your concerns in this space as well? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Really grateful to be here. My name is Amber Hewitt. I'm the director of the D.C. Mayor's Office of Racial Equity and the chief equity officer for the District of Columbia government. I'm a licensed psychologist by training, so I will defer to my physician panelists on, on some of the uh, more clinical questions, but excited to be here to talk about how we are approaching this work um, from a racial equity lens, looking at government operations, and also acknowledging how government actions, both big and small, um, have contributed to inequities. I think that's a critical part of racial equity and justice work um, and the great opportunity that we have as uh, government and policy um, leaders. And also talk a little bit about some of Mayor Bowser's uh, priorities and selected investments around maternal mortality. This has been a priority for her um, throughout her administration. So, as Joe mentioned, so part of our work is applying a racial equity lens, and I know that's become sort of a, a buzzword, but that simply means being explicit about race, being explicit about structural racism as a driver of racial inequities. Sometimes it's easy for us to sort of explain away racial inequities or disparities, um, say, by individual factors or socioeconomic disparities. But as Joe mentioned um, in his intro, socioeconomic differences do not explain um, racial disparities. And an exercise that I often do with my government colleagues when we're talking about sort of how we can approach this work um, is a metaphor called the groundwater approach. So I just want to walk you briefly through this visual visualization exercise to sort of think about how structural racism leads to inequities um, and how we have to really look upstream um, and not sort of just blaming um, the individual. So imagine that you are, you know, in your neighborhood and you come across one dead fish in a lake. What question or questions would you ask yourself? Most of you would ask sort of what's wrong with that fish? How can we help that fish? But imagine it's the second day you're passing by that same lake and it's hundreds of fish belly up in this lake. And usually when I do that exercise, there's a lot more alarm. What's going on in the water? Is the water toxic? I need to get out of here. But if you take that exercise one step further and say every, on your long walk throughout your day, every body of water that you are passing by has hundreds of fish belly up in the lake. And that's when we have to think about the groundwater, which we know all of our water streams are connected to. And that's what we use as a metaphor for structural racism. So what are the institutional policies, the implicit bias that, you know, within medical education and medical uh, practice? What are some of those policies and upstream determinants that we can address that's causing those disparities? So that's how we're sort of looking at this work um, in the District of Columbia. Um, that's highlighted in several of the mirrors um, investments. Um, and also in breaking ground on the Cedar Regional Hill Medical Center um, in Ward 8, which will increase access to maternal um, and newborn care, but also some of those uh, uh, social and structural drivers. So there was a DC Health Equity Report that was released in 2018 that named nine key drivers that are contributing um, to uh, poor um, outcomes. And I know we'll talk more about that later, but I think it's important to address that, but also put that in the context of racism, uh, sexism, um, and other forms of oppression. And I'll just end by seeing uh, some of the ways that Mayor Bowser is sort of looking at the whole system of care, not just what's happening um, in medical settings, but looking at food access. 
So uh, she developed a food access fund that provides grants to um, having greater access to fresh foods. Uh, $1.5 million to direct cash for one year for select um, expectant mothers. Uh, so it's also important for sort of think about the whole system of care. Um, so that's sort of the lens that I'm bringing to the conversation. And that's a great lens for us to have, in the, especially as we go to our next panelist, uh, who is one of the foremost experts on obesity throughout the United States of America and also the world. Uh, so next up is Dr. Fatima Stanford. Uh, Dr. Stanford, why don't you talk to us about your perspective here today? Absolutely. First of all, it's a delight to be here with you this morning. And I just, it's just wonderful coming behind these two wonderful women who've really set me up um, to talk about what I'll talk about. As was mentioned, I'm Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. I'm an obesity medicine physician scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I'm also an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. I'm one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians, and why that's important is when we talk about this disease we call obesity, which we discussed yesterday, we have to recognize how that's related to the health outcomes that we've been talking about today. What we do know is that obesity is the most chronic, prevalent disease that we've ever seen in our lives. When we're looking at the numbers here in the United States, over 110 million Americans have the disease of obesity. About 220 million have both overweight and obesity. We're talking about over 74% of the population. I want you guys to capture that in your brain. Now, when we talk about this, and we talk about the disproportionate impact on women of color, particularly black women, we have to hone in a little further. Because as was stated yesterday, what we do know is that 80% of black women have overweight and obesity. When we look at COVID-19, which Dr. Villanueva brought up, she mentioned something extremely important. She talked about the overlay of maternal health and COVID. We heard this issue about racism. What we do know is that the number one risk factor for dying from COVID was obesity. Mm -hmm. The number one risk factor for sickness, hospitalization, ICU stays for COVID-19 was obesity. And what we do know, even though I'm not an OBGYN, but I do know this from Dr. Villanueva and her colleagues, is that 50% of all pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. What we do know is that when we go into a pregnancy, there is a concept that happens called fetal programming. That means if a mother goes into pregnancy with overweight and obesity, she has increased inflammation or inflammatory markers in her body, which is being transmitted to her offspring. And so what ends up happening is we see increase in things like cortisol, CRP, which is C-reactive protein, all of these inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, IL tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these things, and also MCP1. What that then leads to is this exposure in utero, which then increases the prevalence of chronic diseases in the offspring. We see not only obesity, we see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we see hyperlipidemia, which means high cholesterol, we see diabetes in the offspring. Now you may be like, okay, so what, is, what does that have to do with the mom? How can we modify that? I told you 50% of pregnancies were unplanned. We have this idea of fetal programming that we can actually modify. There was a large study that came out in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2009, which was a prospective study. And it did one thing, it compared children born to mothers prior to the mom having bariatric surgery and the same mom and dad having a child after the mom had bariatric surgery. Now you may wonder, how does bariatric surgery play into this? What they saw comparing the older offspring to the younger offspring, once the mom had been modified, her weight status, her cardiometabolic risk factors being, I guess, addressed, they saw a threefold decrease in the risk of severe obesity, a tenfold decrease in obesity. And those same, the genetics didn't change, but we changed the mom. In addition to that, we saw improvement in hormones like ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone that stimulates appetites. It tells us to eat more and store more. That was significantly de decreased in the offspring that were born after metabolic and bariatric surgery. So the message why I'm trying to convey to you is that we need to modify mom's preconception. But I told you that 50% of pregnancies are all planned, which means we need to modify everyone, right? That's what we have to do. But how do we do that? We first begin to recognize that obesity is a disease. And as was mentioned by Dr. Hewitt Garcia, racism plays a large role. 
So if we look at the Black Women's Health Study, which is the largest study ever evaluating black women, what we do know is that individuals that experienced racism as documented by the Black Women's Health Study had higher levels of obesity. These were mostly college-educated or above black women. So this goes back to the point Dr. Villanueva made about socioeconomic status. We're looking at highly educated, the people in this room having outcomes that are worse than our white female counterparts. Is it fair? No, it isn't. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. We need to begin by addressing issues like racism. And when people get uncomfortable about me talking about racism, I could care less because I don't get a chance to choose what I look like when I wake up in the morning, and I don't take off this blackness when I finish my day. So when we talk about this, we have to recognize that this plays into the maternal outcomes that we're seeing today. Let's modify ourselves. Let's speak up in the face of injustice. When John Lewis gave me the Gold Congressional Award in 2001, he told me one thing. And he was my congressman growing up, so I had learned a lot from him. He told me one thing. He said, Fatima, never stop fighting injustice. And that I won't. And those are my opening remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> Dr. Stanford reminded me earlier that she pledged in 1998 and I pledged in 1999, so she was going to be my big sister. And he's on this my panel. little brother. And, hey, so that's where we're going to go with it. So I'm going to go back to you and ask you one question. Like, yeah. what strategies can be utilized to optimize weight status in black women in reproductive age? Well, I think the first thing is we have to recognize it's a disease and actually treat it as such. What we do know is that despite the higher prevalence of overweight and obesity in black communities, we are 50% less likely to receive a diagnosis of the disease. So if we don't even receive the diagnosis, you can imagine we're not getting the treatment. And even if you look at the whole population, we know that only 2% of the population that meets criteria for metabolic and bariatric surgery gets that treatment. That's of all comers in the United States. And only 1% that meet criteria for medication for the treatment of the chronic disease of obesity get access. So we're talking about 3% of individuals, that's the, everyone. And then imagine how those numbers narrow once we get to looking at racial and ethnic minorities. Studies that I've published in JAMA, JAMA Pediatrics, et cetera, show that what happens is we are less likely to get referred. We are looking at the numbers both in the pediatric and adult populations for both bariatric surgery and pharmacotherapy, and we're much, much less likely to get access. We need to start treating our women with respect. We need to start treating this disease as the chronic disease it is. And we need to optimize their weight and health status, their cardiometabolic health status, preconception. OK. I see we've been joined by Dr. Basu. So Dr. Basu, uh, let's give you an opportunity to give your opening statement. Um, I want to make sure that you can hear us. Thumbs up, yes? Yes. All right. Uh, well, so we'll turn it over to you for your opening statement. OK, thank you so much. I am uh, Dr. Rupa Basu, and I really uh, thank you so much for letting me join virtually today. Um, I think for my introduction, I'm going to just show a few quick slides. So by training, I'm an environmental epidemiologist, and um, that just means I do a lot of um, studies on um, environmental exposures and health outcomes. My uh, focus is really Um, just a little bit of, of background. I know some of this we've already discussed, and um, let me start here. Um, my title is uh, Epidemiologic Studies of Adverse Birth Outcomes from Heat Exposure, a Closer Look at Disparities. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, from an epidemiologist's uh, point of view, add that heat really affects all organs that we've studied so far in humans. Um, there's the classic heat-related illness and dehydration, but also cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, um, mental health, liver and kidney disease, uh, gastrointestinal disease, respiratory diabetes, and of course, adverse birth outcomes. Uh, I've talked a lot about some of the um, adverse birth outcomes. Um, uh, Preterm delivery um, is a big one, stillbirth, and uh, term low birth weight. Um, just to kind of talk about why it is important to look at symptoms of dehydration. Symptoms of dehydration are often the same 
as uh, symptoms of pregnancy. So headache, nausea, vomiting, for example, um, are often overlooked um, and are often not connected to the heat itself. And so it's really important to look for some of these uh, symptoms and uh, avoid some of this, these um, adverse outcomes that could result. Um, the dehydration actually leads to oxidative stress and inflammation, which releases oxytocin, which decreases uterine blood flow, decreases fetal growth, and induces labor, often prematurely. One of the first large-scale studies that, were, that was ever published, um, I'm happy to report I was uh, an author of this study. I really thought of this um, for my own pregnancies. I know that uh, heat impacts the elderly. At this point, we were thinking that it was really just the elderly that were at high risk. Didn't even think about all the other uh, populations. But I did notice that during my own pregnancies, I uh, felt the same thing that I've been writing about, that I wasn't able to thermoregulate efficiently and uh, you know control my body temperature, um, feeling hot at times when other people weren't, um, trying to change environments. Um, so I thought I would look at temperature and uh, preterm delivery. Um, and then um, found this disparity uh, by race and um, all mothers that were studied had increased risk, as you can see here. But um, I just wanna uh, point out that compared to uh, white mothers who had a 6.6% .6 increase for 10 degree Fahrenheit increase in apparent temperature, black mothers had almost a 15% increase. We also see this increase um, among um, Hispanic mothers at about 8% and Asian mothers at uh, 10%. So really um, the disparities are, are pretty clear here. And um, I was uh, uh, a co-author of this uh, review paper that uh, was published a couple of years ago. And um, it was a systematic review in the US. And since that first study was published, uh, we've had, um, many studies um, in this review, for example, there are 68 studies. Um, these are just in the US, but we've seen the same association in um, international studies as well, and really shows that there is um, an association between fine particulate matter, ozone, heat, preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth that is consistent across all of these locations. But of course, the most uh, Another finding is that there were disparities by race across these studies as well. And I wanna really point out, um, we've talked about some of the reasons for disparities, but we didn't talk yet so much about the environmental racism um, or environmental justice issues. Really, um, there's also not just, we, we talked about some of the healthcare issues, some of the um, disparities um, of workers and in and, and the healthcare field, but we didn't talk about the environmental risk factors as much yet. So really, I just want to point out that um, Black mothers, also Hispanic and Asian mothers, sometimes often uh, live closer to power plants, fossil fuel combustion areas, freeways, traffic. Um, these are all uh, exposures um, that increase for um, air pollution, particulate matter, but also uh, heat. Um, urban heat island effect is actually pretty uh, large in these communities because there is less green space and a lot of blacktop to absorb and retain the heat. Um, lower socioeconomic status has also been discussed. We know that um, you know some, so that explains some of this, but not all. And um, with air conditioning, um, we know that these um, associations between temperature and these adverse birth outcomes still exist. So really that's not the uh, only issue here. Um, and of course, we can't rely just on air conditioning because of uh, power outages and blackouts that we've already seen. Um, and of course, uh, less access to healthcare. But even with the same access to healthcare, there's still differential treatment. There's not enough minority women, particularly, who are healthcare practitioners providing um, healthcare. Community um, involvement is also uh, very uh, large. Because I do want to point out that a lot of this is preventable. So if we can study, you know, what are the reasons for these disparities, we can actually also address these disparities is what the hope is, um, and really reduce a lot of these um, adverse birth outcomes due to climate change exposures. We know that climate change is getting worse, so we really um, need to act upon this. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for your attention.
Some sobering statistics. Thank you very much for sharing those, not only slides with us, but that information, because it sets the tone for the rest of the panel about not only the external factors that may arrive, uh, help us arrive at this conversation, but also some of the ways that they can be improved. I know federal legislation is one of the big drivers of uh, how we change this conversation, and right now Congress is considering the momnibus bill, uh, as well as a number of different states are considering legislation around this. Um, to date, federal legislation is the primary driver for the state adoption of high-value maternity services, uh, including uh, looking through Medicaid and how Medicaid adoption allows for increased spending on a lot of the maternal issues that we'll also address here today. Uh, I've been asked uh, some questions to pose to my panelists, so I'm going to start with you, Dr. Villanueva. How do you advise birthing persons of color to advocate for themselves in a biased uh, healthcare system to mitigate their increased risk for maternal mortality? I think that's a great question. It's, it's really something that patients come in asking about. And I think if you, as, as much as we see the statistics, birthing persons are, 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 are seeing the news and understand their own risk. So they are coming in asking, how can I, how can I keep myself from dying in, in birth? I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a difficult way to start off a, what, what should be a wonderful conversation with your patient. But, that, but that's the reality of the system that we're in. Um, I think the, the first thing I, I always really want to keep in mind is that we're not, this is not, the, the patient is not at fault here, right? It's really nice to have, create that narrative where we talk about women or birthing persons not being educated enough to understand what they should be eating, how they should be acting, how they should be exercising. But I think we really understand that, that the onus is on us as the healthcare provider to really, um, to really understand, and I think we talked about this yesterday when we were talking about obesity, understand the whole person, understand where they're coming from, understand where they live, their limitations perhaps at whether they have enough, I think Dr. Knight um, spoke about this yesterday, whether they're um, cooking for them themselves, which they you generally never are, but they're cooking for a family and what they can afford to cook for that family, whether they can afford to exercise, whether they live in a spa uh, an area that, that is safe, as, as I said before, to exercise in. So, so I think it's, it's really important as the, as the providers that we are, are um, looking at the whole person and not just really cookie cutter approach to taking care of a birthing person. But I, I really, I think, I think what um, uh, Dr. Cody uh, talked about was really important is those preventable things before patients get pregnant. And so for me, it's, it's um, almost as important that first prenatal visit as the visit before that when they're just coming in for their pap smear, a regular visit. And I discuss with them if they're considering getting pregnant um, or even if they're not, if they're not on birth control. I think that's really something, those unintended pregnancies is really a place where we can make a, a, a significant impact. But really discussing and look at, looking at those modifiable risk factors. I think my patients know that I am very much of a um, uh, uh, physical education and nutrition, um, I will say advocate. I think that's a nice way to put, put it. I don't think they would think about it that way. Um, but I, I, I think some patients are taken aback by the questions when they're not pregnant of, uh, what are you doing for exercise? How 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 are you are you physically active? Especially in, in COVID, most people were were not even leaving their I live in New York, so their apartments for days on end, um, and how that impacted their overall health. How are they are they uh, what what are they eating? Are they are they binge eating? A lot of people in these times of stress have been binge eating and poor nutrition, and really just looking at those modifiable factors. We know that that overwhelmingly for women of color, we're dying of um, cardiovascular disease and um, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and post in the postpartum period. So really looking at the fact that 50% of women over 20, black women over 20, have hypertension and really addressing those factors. Do they have a primary care physician? Do they have a, a physician home? Do they feel comfortable with someone to discuss those issues. And if they don't, they know that I'm discussing that it with them. Um, and I think that having those discussions about those modifiable risk factors that they have, um, whether they're already pregnant or, or thinking of becoming pregnant or just, just trying to keep our, 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 uh, our community safe in general, 
really look, looking at those things. I also really do speak to um, patients about advocating for themselves just in the healthcare space in general. I think it's really important that it's, it's difficult. Um, it's a difficult conversation because we want them to trust us as our, their healthcare providers, but we also know that there are many reasons why they don't trust us, many reasons why they're, they feel disrespected and have been disrespected in our healthcare system. And really having them understand that their um, concerns and what their feelings are, are, valid, are valid. And if they don't have, um, if they don't feel comfortable in a particular setting, that they have the option and the ability to, to go somewhere else. And I think that's, that's very important as well. I think so, so for me, I think it's, it's really looking at the, the patient when they come in and those modifiable risk factors that can improve their overall outcomes, whether they're pregnant or not. Dr. Hewitt, um, we've talked about uh, systemic, systemic issues that have led us to this place. What role can government policymakers play to improve the systems of care, not only for women, but also women of color and also women dealing with maternal health issues? Thank you for that question. I'll build off of what Dr. Villanueva said about looking at the whole person, but also looking at the whole system and recognizing that birthing people and uh, women of color and black women specifically have been advocating um, for themselves. I'll always think about uh, Serena Williams and the mm -hmm. experience that she had to go through when she was giving birth and trying to explain uh, sort of what was going on with her, one of the most recognizable black women um, in the world, very well um, resourced. So I just wanted to highlight that point, but advocating within a system that has um, already those institutional, um, those institutional barriers. And I think it's important to think about this holistically. And one of the things that, um, so I, I started off my career as a uh, child psychologist and a psychology professor in transition to government. Um, and one of my constant observations is, is that it's very easy to be siloed um, in government. Um, and we have to look at um, issues when it comes to uh, racial health inequities, particularly uh, maternal mortality, that we have to look at how all of these structures come together. So what's happening in the healthcare system, but how that's tied to other, uh, other sectors as well. So for example, if you put affordable housing in an area that has poor performing schools, what do you think is going to happen to the kids in that neighborhood? They're probably going to have poor educational outcomes. So we have to look at this holistically, and I think um, that's something that we're trying to do and really implementing the DC Health Equity Report that really identified those nine key drivers that I think we've, that we've touched, touched upon, such as nutrition, um, we've talked about housing, education, employment, um, income, transportation, the food environment, um, the outdoor environment, and community safety. So how can we, how can all of those sectors come together and focus on on improving health outcomes. So we recently convened um, a health equity summit and we had representations from the Metropolitan Police Department, the Fire Department, Department of Insur Insurance, Securities and Banking, the Department of Energy and Environment, um, uh, similar uh, to um, our other panels who talked about air pollution and environmental hazards. All of these sectors, sectors have to come together to, uh, to focus on health outcomes. The onus can't just be uh, um, on the fabulous providers um, and the fabulous systems, but all of those other sectors that are contributing um, to, those, to those poor outcomes. And one of my favorite thinkers on this topic is Dr. Joy, Joya Career Perry, who talked about, you know, you can write a prescription for housing, but that isn't going to cure someone's housing insecurity. We really have to have deep, uh, affordable investment. So one of the things that we're trying to do um, uh, as policymakers is making sure that we're looking at uh, all of these inequities holistically, um, but also as we're developing policies and programs, how can we apply a racial equity lens? We can have a universal goal, but we, have to, we may have to have targeted strategies. And we know that folks who are closer to the policy problem also have the policy solutions. So approaching this um, from a policy implementation and policy design standpoint from a strength-based and asset-based approach and really prioritizing the voices and the women um, and birthing people who have the lived experiences as we're developing uh, policy and program interventions. And oh, I, sorry, I just wanted to, to piggyback on that. I think the legislation that we're looking at, Momnibus and, and, and Congresswoman Kelly's Mamas Act, those all look at like comprehensive um, aspects to maternal care, everything from um, implicit bias training, um, uh, and, and, increasing diversity of clinical trials, increasing the, matern the prenatal workforce. It looks specifically at those social determinants of health. It looks at um, um, mental health issues, really just that holistic um, approach that, that you're are speaking about. I think the, 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 um, 
the uh, sort of issue always becomes the money behind the, the policies. <laughs> but I think those, if we, you know, if just those legislation themselves could really make a significant impact um, in the maternal mortality crisis, if we could get those um, passed. I think at last check, there were 170 sponsors of the Momnibus right now. And we're still looking for more uh, sponsors of the legislation so that it could be passed. Hopefully, um, I know that we just had Black Maternal Health Week. Uh, and there was a big push to get more sponsors on the bill, but there's still a lot of folks who have black women in their districts that vote for them or vote or at least have the power to vote in their districts that should be listening, should be considering sponsoring this legislation. And hopefully after we leave here, uh, some folks will send members of Congress emails, letters, or communication expressing why they think that's an important thing, just as Dr. Villanueva has just shared. Now behind legislation is usually uh, research and policy um, policy conversations like Dr. Basu in the information that you presented to us about how environmental and other factors should be considered when you are thinking through legislation. Placing a freeway is one thing, but placing a freeway and having an understanding of how that will also affect um, maternal health in a neighborhood is also something that we should be concerned about. Um, how can we help women understand their role in advocacy throughout the equation, not just after they've become, uh, or birthing people have become in a situation where a child may be imminent, but also as they're members of the community, how they can advocate through research such as your own um, to, to help improve the health outcomes of the entire neighborhood? Well, that's a really excellent question. Um, as I mentioned before, it's uh, preventable. And so if we can, I'm really more on the exposure, the environmental risk factor side of things. And I think that if we can reduce exposures, that would really uh, benefit us in the long run um, in terms of adverse birth outcomes. And also um, somebody mentioned it's a long-term effect. So what I mean by that is um, if a baby is born preterm, there will be um, often consequences uh, throughout childhood, throughout adulthood, um, neurodevelopment, um, you know, uh, brain and also heart, um, respiratory effects. And so it's really important to start from the beginning and um, prevent some of this. Um, and the ways that it could be done is that we often um, work on a uh, reducing uh, criteria air pollutants or developing standards in the state of California. And we also help with the federal um, standards as well. And by um, looking at vulnerable communities in a little bit uh, with more emphasis, I think would help a lot. If we just look at the entire state, for example, that's not gonna be as helpful as really kind of honing in on the areas that are most impacted maybe you know, not just by race or ethnicity, but also maybe uh, more of a asthmatic population, just as an example. So um, we're trying to do more of that, trying to get better at it. But I think that that is an area that um, needs, uh, still needs a lot more work. So if we place them in a healthier environment on the outside by looking at their exposure, looking at environmental issues that may pop up around them and seeing if we can mitigate, now we move towards how we can help them be healthier on the inside. All right, so right. Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, what, what are some of the factors that we should consider nutritional exercise uh, to help them be more healthy on the inside as well? Not only uh, the birthing person, but also the people supporting the birthing person uh, that, that can help. So absolutely, I think that you know one of the key things I want us to kind of broaden our perspective is when we look at, for example, something like obesity, we often think of it as a nutritional disease. And I wanna make sure that we don't conflate nutrition with obesity. While that is one component, what we do know is genetics, development, environment, and behavior play a role in a person's likelihood of developing the disease that obesity. And the key thing that I wanna make sure that I don't leave this stage without saying is that weight is more heritable than height. And so I'm going to say that once more, because you're like, what did she just say? And that is that weight is more heritable than height. That means that if a child is born to parents that have the disease of obesity, there is a 50 to 85% likelihood, even with optimal nutrition and physical activity and resources, that they will themselves have the disease that is obesity. And so when we have our biases, we talked about, for example, bias training, these, are, these things of that sort, we look at families, we might see them walking around and we're like, gosh, what are they feeding those kids? 
when indeed it was transmitted by their parents, not necessarily what they're feeding. Maybe they're really going in hard. And so let's think about what we're talking about in, in terms of nutrition. I don't need you to go and get on this fad diet or this fad diet or this fad diet, because as soon as you lose weight, your hypothalamus, which, which is the part of your brain that defends your set point, your weight will return to where that set point is and actually come above that. That's called weight cycling, okay? So when we get on the grapefruit diet, for those that are old enough to remember that, <laughs> or the cabbage diet, okay? Or, you know, we can keep going because we know that Atkins and keto are basically the same thing, all right? So if we go on these diets, we cycle, and then we come back to this point that's even higher. And then we wonder why our white weight titrates up because the brain gets very angry with us. What we need to be doing sustainably over the life course is looking at things that we need to be eating, and this is regardless of your diet preferences, which is lean protein, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and the less processed, the better. Mm -hmm. I don't ask my patients about the number of calories they're eating because I do not care. Let me tell you why I don't care. Because a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. Right, if I were to give you a bag of jelly beans, which is let's say 1,000 calories, I have no idea what's in a bag of jelly beans, let's just come up with a number, and I give you 1,000 calories worth of kale, chickpeas, hummus, um, tomatoes, and cucumbers. The brain does not see those the same. What we do know, and actually this is studies that came out of Kevin Hall's lab at the NIH, that in just two weeks of exposure to a, a processed diet, which means it doesn't look like it looks in nature, and no cheeses do not look like anything in nature, you guys. <laughs> okay, just let's, let's make sure we just get rid of that. For, that's, a, that's another story for another day. But anyway, we compare that to those that are not processed. They brought them in the labs at the NIH, and in two weeks they saw a deviation in weight status regardless of very insignificant differences in the calorie intake that one took in. So that's the physical, that's the, the nutrition part. Physical activity, which is my thing, my favorite thing. I, I didn't see any of you guys in the workout room this morning while I was doing my tread boot camp. Just thought I'd call that out. But anyway, so other than that, what we do know is we want to promote physical activity, but we don't want a cookie cutter approach. We, I always tell my patients, they're like, well, what do you do? I said, no, no, no. What do you enjoy doing? Yes. I want you to do what you enjoy doing because what you enjoy doing is what you will do in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So for example, I hate skiing. If my doctor came in and told me that was the activity I needed to do to stay fit, I would be inactive because I hate skiing. Now, if you wanna do some high intensity interval training, we can go there, but that's what my body enjoys. So it's about meeting them where they are, finding where they are, and then we look at the type of activity. So we look at at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. What that means is you could talk but not sing during the activity unless you were like Beyonce, all right? Then you could do both, okay? <laughs> but in general, okay? Um, that's what we're looking at. But for most patients that have overweight and obesity, we actually have a target of 300 minutes, which would be the equivalent of about an hour, five days a week. That's the target that we wanna maintain over the life course not just starting beach body and working out with Sean T. That's cool, that's cool right? I love Sean T. Sean T and I are cool people. I mean, right. he doesn't know it yet, but now he'll know. <laughs> um, but the whole thing is I want something that's sustainable over the life course, something that we can do. So when we're talking about nutrition and physical activity, those are important. But we need to look at those larger things. So a lot of people don't know that the medications that they take are responsible for their obesity. You're like, what? 20% of the weight issues we have in this country are due to medications we as doctors prescribe to you for other issues, like which ones? Lithium, Depakote, Tegretol, Celexa, Cymbalta, Effexor, Paxil, Zoloft, Ambien, Trazodone, Lunesta, Gabapentin, Glyburide, Glipizide, Lamepiride, Metopolol, Tenolol, Propanolol, Long-Term Insulin, Long-Term Prednisone, just to name the ones I felt like saying without running out of breath there. <laughs> but the whole point is, is that we're not evaluating those things when patients coming in. We're not evaluating how stress may have contributed to their um, excess adiposity. And during COVID-19, people think it was the activity that led to weight increases. Actually, several studies have been published that sh showed that actually physical activity went up. That's why Peloton stock went up during the pandemic, for example, for those high SES individuals. But what we do know universally, regardless of your race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, the thing that went up universally was stress. Mm -hmm. When stress goes up, what happens? Storage of adipose. Adipose is fat. The organ that is fat, storage of adipose goes up because our brains can't recognize that this is going to last for a long time and we don't know when this will end. So the weight shift that we saw as the CDC maps became darker because they were heat maps had to do with stress. And so we have to tackle stress and we know that communities of color are experiencing greater stress sores over the life course 
than other communities for the many reasons that have been really elucidated today. So uh, before we get ready to go to questions from the audience, you know, I know from being the son of a preacher that you have to give specific ask if you want people to actually do things, right? So uh, H.R. 1897 or the Mamas Act is the thing that we have been told to advocate for. So I want to make sure that you have that number in front of you, H.R. 1897 in the Mamas Act that was sponsored by Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Uh, who's done a great job advocating in this space. So I want to make sure that we, uh, before we get ready for questions and answers from the audience, uh, if you have any questions, please, there are two microphones at either side of the room uh, that you can line up for, and we'll start calling on folks to ask those questions. Uh, but before we get there, uh, I know Dr. Villanueva, you shared with me that you like exercise. Dr. Stanford, you shared that you like exercise as well. Dr. Hewitt, did you want to talk any more about your <laughs> exercise goals? And Dr. Yeah. Basu, I want to yeah, make sure, I, yeah. I don't want to get in trouble with anybody not let anybody talk about their exercise advocacy <laughs> before we go to questions. I'm a Peloton guy myself, uh, former athlete, uh, currently serving as counsel at the NFL Players Association, ahead of their government relations. So I'm around guys that exercise a lot, and I know that that becomes a factor in life. So we're, But they we're, stop exercising. Let me just stop them. They stop uh, exercising. Once they get out of the league, average life expectancy in the league, 2.1 years, if I'm not correct. 3.4. Oh, okay. So we're, we went we're working on it. Right. But the whole point is, is that we need to keep them exercising. So have them come talk to me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you after we get done. Especially your offensive lines. Uh, I just, just bring them up. As a former offensive lineman, I'll take all of those <laughs> pieces of fact. Mayo, can you ask your question so I can get out of trouble, please? Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm Dr. Chelsea Moreland. I am a family physician by trade, um, but I do full spectrum care, including prenatal care. Um, and so my question is, what are you all's thoughts around um, some of the innovative models, such as centering pregnancy, um, that we have available to us, but that a lot of our colleagues aren't utilizing yet? I'm sorry, centering, what, what models are you sp speaking of? I'm sorry. Centering pregnancy, so it's a group-based prenatal care model um, that... Okay. Okay. I mean, I think... I think you bring up a, a, a very a valid point. I think that's why we come together in, in, in spaces like this to have those discussions. Um, it's really, for us, so important, as we know, for those um, uh, taking care of birthing persons to, to keep that holistic model and that, that patient-centered model. Um, and I think just making sure that our colleagues do the same. I think, as, as, um, as uh, was said previously, we have always taken care of ourselves, and I think there's especially new, some new technological platforms and health platforms that are specifically geared towards the birthing process using doulas. I think in, 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 the, in um, New York City, that's going to be actually covered, midwifery and doula services uh, for our patients as well. Um, so I think it's just continuing to advocate, advocate for those things, yes. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Gabriel Felix. I'm a psychiatry resident in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so thank you so much for this panel. Um, and I'm glad we, we talked about inclusivity and you know, talking about climate justice, housing security, you know, food apartheid, as I like to call it, and how that affects birthing people. I'm wondering if you could all talk more about you know, any local or national initiatives that you may or may not be in, you know, involved in, just so that we're aware of you know, other efforts to kind of address this you know, issue with health equity in terms of birthing persons. I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll just say, uh, as president of NMA this year, maternal health has been one of my priorities, and, and women's health in general, and reproductive justice, have all been part of our, our priorities. One thing that we've been trying to do is really more in outwardly facing to our patients themselves and providing or resources. To, how to, to allocate. Like I know, for instance. So we have partnered with a pregnancy and parenting website to provide a maternal health resource hub to discuss issues um, of black maternal mortality, what patients can do uh, to provide them with resources about um, uh, modifying their preventable risk factors um, early on, talking about vaccination rates, which are particularly poor among um, black uh, birthing persons in the United States and, and how this is important in protecting themselves and the unborn children. So, so really, going toward providing those resources to patients themselves because I think birthing, birthing persons are really, they're struggling. They're really coming to you as a provider scared and they are looking for, um, 
They're looking for you not only to take care of them, um, but to also um, understand how they can help to take care of themselves. I'll add a couple points. I don't know if this directly um, answers your question, but in the realm of environmental justice, we saw uh, the Biden administration release uh, at the federal level racial equity action plans, and that's definitely a movement we're seeing across jurisdictions. DC, we're currently developing our racial equity um, action plan, so not just maternal health, but sort of health broadly and equities broadly and really looking at it um, holistically. Um, but I also think another thing that the momnibus <laughs> addresses is around data collection, so making sure that we are disaggregating data by race, ethnicity, primary language, and other um, factors to, to track our progress over time. So that's one thing that we're trying to uh, do a better job in district government so that we can sort of see how we're moving the needle, but also when it comes to health equity, sort of looking at those other social and structural drivers and breaking down those silos and looking at intervi interventions that are cross-sectoral. Mm -hmm. So a couple other things, right? Like in the Mamas Act or HR 1897, there's also the establishment of regional uh, centers of excellence around maternal health uh, that could become a part of the legislation that passed, as well as the Alliance of Innovation on Maternal Health uh, that would work on the ensuring the hospitals in those areas adopt, implement, uh, adopt and implement data-driven maternal safety bundles as well. So. Um, one, another reason why the legislation by Robin Kelly is really important for us to find other people to help sponsor yeah. so we can get it passed. I think it's the standardization of care. It's really also, Mama's Act also looks at um, the maternal mortality review committees and, and those are so important because they take a root cause analysis as why each particular maternal death, what happened? Mm -hmm. How do we prevent that? What, was there a failure of the system? Usually there was. And, 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 and I think that, that those, um, those critical uh, evaluations of each maternal death as in communities, because it, in certain communities you see differences. I'm in New York, and the maternal death rate is eight times that for black women as white women. So, uh, Yes. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for this panel. <clears throat> My name is Madhuri. I'm the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity at Morehouse School of Medicine. So, I'm coming from a behavioral health perspective. I appreciated the commentary on stress tolerance. I've been privileged to be a behavioral health provider in lots of different types of settings. I think one of the biggest things I've always heard is I can't make the appointments. Um, and that's really because you may be in an apartment where you're taking care of not only your own kids, somebody else's kids, your grandparents, et cetera. Um, and I think about mobile health Mm -hmm. as kind of an innovation in the developing world and other countries that have been really effective in reducing maternal mortality, but also kind of combating that stress tolerance piece. Um, and in behavioral health, mobile health has actually started expanding a lot in the country, like 988 and Psychiatric Crisis Line now will kind of make that a priority for folks in crisis. It makes me think about how much that can be bridged. And so my question is also incentivizing providers to want to work in spaces where there may be a provider desert. Um, so, you know, for example, if there's only one culturally responsive clinic in an urban setting, that may be the only place that's serving thousands and thousands of moms. Uh, but as well in rural parts of the country, like American Indian, Alaska Native folks live on tribal reservations, sometimes only accessible by helicopter in certain parts of our country. So if a mom is in crisis, can't be reached. So I'm curious to know how you feel about bridging that gap in those parts of the country where we have a provider desert. Um, because stress tolerance, if you're being told by your doctor, reduce stress, it's a lot harder, especially as being a person of color is stressful in general in America. So I think part of that is something that I always think about from mental health equity, but mental health is integral to overall health. Yeah, actually, I want to address this one because I think one of the key things that we have to think about, particularly we saw this elevation of telemedicine, which you didn't address yeah. during mm -hmm. your um, actual um, comments. I think, you know, a mobile model, we've used that at um, Harvard Medical School to go out into the communities of Dorchester, Mattapan, for example, um, for many years. But what we find and what I have found during the pandemic is I I was delivering 100% telemedicine to my patients um, for 14 months straight, is that you can get to them. And interestingly enough, many of them do have a smartphone. So they may be looking, you may be looking at the ceiling and tell them to like bring it back into view, but you're able to get to them where they live. And actually it's easier than them trying to trek into downtown Boston for me, pay $40 per hour to park, all of these types of things. They can go into the closet at you know, the 7-Eleven where they may be working and talk to me for a few minutes and then I can at least have a touch point 
with them that allows me to bridge that time. And so that allows us to get into those communities where we are resource constricted and provider constricted. Now, I happen to know that I grew up not too far from Morehouse in Atlanta, so you happen to have a large, actually the zip code of 30331 has more black doctors per capita than anywhere in the country. Um, so they have a, you know, a different circumstance than like what we have in Boston, where I'm seeing many people that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s telling me I'm the first black, black doctor they've ever seen. I'm like, oh gosh, because you know, it's very different than my lived experience growing up in Atlanta. So I think we can utilize mobile health services, but that may be resource intensive, whereas telemedicine is not as mm -hmm. resource intensive, allows us to get to individuals either via phone, smartphone, or if they have good broadband, which of course is another issue what we've been talking mm -hmm. about nationally, about making sure that people have that broadband access, which for example, in the state of West Virginia, for example, I've heard that over 50% of the state is still on dial up, which is just bewildering to me. So you have to recognize how we can get there. We can use asynchronous visits also, where patients just type a little thing in like they're due to a text so they can tell you what's going on with them, particularly in mental health circumstances where it may be something that needs to be responded to immediately. So I just, that's just my perspective on how we can use both the mobile care model, which I think um, will, will be one thing to use, but more, a little bit more resource intensive than using telemedicine to get um, the providers out to where they need to be. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. My name is Dr. Regis, and I was on our earlier panel, and I've been a board-certified gynecologist at OBGYN Doc since 1982, and I've served on several committees looking at this premature labor and delivery, black infant mortality and morbidity. And i got to tell you that this panel is, is really encouraging me because over the past 40 years and so many committees from University of Pennsylvania to Hot John Hop, so many major medical centers, I began to wonder whether there was something intrinsic about our experience here. When you X out all these other factors, there's something else going on here about our experience being in America that, that resulted in these results. Mm -hmm. And from listening to you ladies speak and gentlemen speak, it, it encourages me because I was beginning to have uh, some doubts that whether we could actually change or level out the experience in black women and babies experienced in this country because of some of the background stress and inherent inequities that are there and that I don't see going anywhere anytime soon. But the work that you guys are doing, it really encourages me because I was very discouraged. So I want to give you kudos for that. Hello. Okay. I have to change the mic. I'm a not as tall. Okay, hi everyone. I am uh, Dr. Tiffany Bell Washington. I'm here from Harvard T.H. Chan. I'm getting my MPH. Um, I'll be done in less than a month, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm a quadruple board certified physician, oh, nice. um, actually specializing in psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, lifestyle medicine, and obesity medicine. So what I want to say is thank you very much for this talk. I thought it was amazing. The panel is awesome. I wrote a few notes. I don't forget, but I'll be very fast. Um, maternal health is very important to me for many reasons. I'm a mom of um, four children, five and under. Um, and I want to say, even as a physician, my experience as a patient was just what? that. Let's uh, give her a clap. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait. You see, I have to skip over that. Just, just for that alone. Oh, I have to pause. I'm sorry. We're not yeah, going to skip over that. <laughs> We're going to say it and run, okay, <laughs> just in case. So, and I'm awake, so that's good. Um, yeah, so I, I had an experience, even as a physician, where, you know, I had to tell them, I'm a physician. I'm concerned about, for instance, my blood pressure. This is a problem. They're like, oh, you're stressed, don't worry. I'm like, no, pay, pay attention to this, you know. Yeah. And so I think we have to advocate for our patients in that way, physically to say, you know, if, if I can't do it as a physician, how do they do it as someone who didn't graduate from high school when you're arguing literally with your doctor? to try to save your life. So that, that's the one thing. On the other side, I want to say that just um, as, a, as a psychiatrist part of me, um, I think it's very important. Uh, I'm also BPA. Um, I'm a trustee for the Black Psychiatrist of America. And I just want to say that um, we have to focus also on the mental health part of it because we're all seeing stress, right? Stress with obesity, stress with the death that happens in maternal uh, mortality. 
And I just um, want to make a plug that as much as we can, we prioritize the mental health, maternal mental health as well. Yeah. And I think the bill might have some money going that way. I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure. It does. Okay, it does. perfect. Um, and I, I just want to put that out there because there's stigma with both, with, with all of these. There's stigma mm -hmm. with obesity. There's stigma with uh, mental health issues. And if we don't focus on it, I think our people will continue to die. And it's very concerning. So I just want to put that out and tell you thank you all very much. So mm -hmm. okay. thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one minute left uh, on this panel, and I would love for everyone to get closing statements, but if you could say one closing sentence instead, that'd be awesome. Let's start with Dr. Villanueva, then we'll go across. I just want to say thank you for uh, an, an amazing panel um, and the opportunity to speak today. I think we uh, really just need to continue to advocate for birthing persons in our communities and really um, advocate for and support legislation that supports the infrastructure of our community and investments back into our communities because it's really those social determinants of health that really undergird all of the issues that are plaguing uh, the chronic, the excess chronic burden of disease in our communities, so including maternal health and obesity. Um, so just thank you. Dr. Hewitt. Thank you as well. I mean, I learned a lot from the esteemed panelists um, here. Um, I know we've talked a lot about the social determinants of health, but just also wanted to highlight the political determinants of health. And I think there was someone from Stature, uh, uh, Daniel Dawes, um, who wrote a book on that and, and you know, how legislation can determine um, you know, health outcomes. And I know we've been talking a lot about the momnibus. momnibus so I just wanted to, um, to highlight that and also put a plug for, if you're in DC, September 15th, um, Mayor Bowser will be hosting a maternal health summit um, later this fall but just thank you. Dr. Basu? Yeah, uh, again, thank you also for uh, letting me join this panel, especially uh, virtually. You know, as a researcher, I come from a, a different viewpoint, I think, and, um, you know, we could keep doing all the research we want, but until we have some changes, some policy changes, some conversations like this, I don't think it's going to uh, really go anywhere. So I, I think it's so important um, to have these discussions, um, to make changes, and um, to really improve um, health. And you know, we talked a lot about Black maternal health, but always, I know we keep this in mind, but it's really a healthy environment overall. You can't be healthy if you're excluding parts of your population. So it's really, uh, you know, that, that's, I guess, the message that I'd like to leave with is it's really, if we're looking at the most vulnerable, then we're protecting everybody. Thank you. And just very briefly, what we have learned today is that maternal morbidity and mortality is a complex multifactorial dis -ish issue. And we can't silo these things out. We need to look at comprehensive strategies and structures like House Bill 1897, Senate Bill 916, which you guys are gonna go talk to your senators and congressmen about today to move this forward, begin to think about these things and begin to take action as soon as you leave here today. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be a moderator on this panel. Again, if you didn't miss it, <laughs> House Bill 1897, <laughs> Senate 916, I can't follow that. I'm just gonna say goodbye. Thank y'all.